Hey everyone, welcome back to The Weekend Charts, the show where I run through the most important charts and themes in markets and investing. Another huge show for you this week, a lot to talk about. We have the latest on inflation, we have the Fed meeting, and so much more. Let's start out by trying to answer this question, is this the end? And really this is a two-part question. First, is this the end of the Fed's series of rate hikes? And B, is this the end of the Fed's era of easy monetary policy that really began during the financial crisis? So let's start out by reviewing where, what the Fed has done over the past 14 months. They started out with a Fed funds rate of zero, essentially, started hiking rates, became more aggressive as in pace of inflation really picked up. The Fed was far behind the curve, as we've talked about again and again. But now the Fed is above 5% for the first time since September 2007. They've hiked a total of 500 basis points. And the market's saying the Fed is done hiking rates, that the Fed's going to pause in June and July, and then actually cut rates, as we'll show in a little bit, starting in September. And if we take a look at where the Fed is in relation to inflation, much different picture today than a year ago. So as we talked about, these two lines were likely to converge. Inflation was likely to come down and the Fed funds rate was likely to come up. And now we finally have this uh, crossing over where the Fed funds rate is above the rate of inflation. We haven't seen that since 2019. And this is what I would consider to be finally restrictive monetary policy territory. And as we've talked about in the past uh, many times, Every time the CPI has been above 5% and the Fed has hiked rates to try to bring it down, as they're doing today, there has been a recession at some point in the future and usually not too distant future. So that remains front and center. Uh, the Fed is increasingly talking about recession. They talked more about it in their last meeting. Powell's kind of hedges, hedging his bet, saying there still could be a soft landing. The data is still obviously positive uh, on employment, as we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. But uh, that remains the big concern, but nevertheless, the bigger risk was the inflation rate and trying to bring it down. And the fed is finally above that level. So in terms of that second question, is the fed done with this ultra easy monetary policy? Let's just put it in context here, how rare the, uh, policy has been, and especially the policy since we had this inflation spike. So these are the, uh, rates of, of fed funds rate and the rates of inflation by decade going back to the 1960s. And as you can see here, we are, we're in the 2020s in far in negative territory. So ultra easy monetary policy as compared to this inflation spike. And throughout the 2010s, really after the financial crisis, after the economy had come out of the recession, the Fed did an extraordinary thing, which is they held, chose to hold interest rates at 0%. And it took them seven years to hike rates. They didn't start hiking rates until 2015. Of course, market participants love that. Uh, but the question is, is this ultra easy stance? Uh, did it do more harm than good at the end of the day? And is the Fed going to go back to a period which we had for a long time during the 1980s and 1990s, and even in the early 2000s, where you had a Fed funds rate, this blue line here, above the rate of inflation? And so that's really the question here. So far, I haven't heard the Fed really talk one way or another about it. I think it's going to be dependent, of course, on a number of factors. What's the path in terms of employment from here? What's the path in terms of inflation? But it's really a philosophical question for the Fed. Do they want to pursue the same policy they pursued after the financial crisis, which is that ultra easy policy? And I think until proven otherwise, that's kind of the expectation of the markets. That market's saying the Fed isn't going to stay up here for very long. In fact, they're going to start cutting rates in September, and they're going to continue to cut rates into next year and throughout 2024, bring that Fed funds rate right back down to 3%. Now, we don't know where the inflation rate will be at that point in time, but the market's betting that the end of the easy money era isn't here. And this is just a temporary period where the Fed has pushed push that Fed funds rate up above the inflation rate, uh, but they're going to be aggressively cutting rates uh, not, too, not too far from now. So that would really be a pretty big shift in a short period of time. Just four months from now, the market's saying the Fed's going to start cutting rates. So I went back and looked at the last three cycles uh, to see if this is the last rate hike, what 
what historically has been kind of the lag between that last hike and the first rate cut. And uh, this may or may not be surprising here, but uh, if we look at the last three times, you had a seven month lag following that December 2018 final final hike. Uh, the Fed started cutting rates in July 2019. Uh, then after the June 2006 uh, rate hike, which was the last one of that cycle, uh, the Fed started cutting rates in September 2007. Of course, they ended up cutting rates all the way down to zero by December 2008 and then held, held them there. And then if we look at May 2000, so a little bit uh, past the dot-com peak, which was in March 2000, Fed does its last rate hike to 6.5%, and they start cutting rates in early 2001. You had a recession that year in 2001. They started cutting rates. They brought them all the way down to 1% uh, during that cycle. So uh, we have a, a range here, 7 to 15 months. Could, they, could, it, could it be shorter this time? Four months? Absolutely. Uh, maybe uh, the market's a little bit uh, optimistic in terms of that expectation, or maybe the market's a little bit pessimistic, depending how you look at it. Because a lot of people are saying, if there aren't clear signs of a recession this September and inflation still remains somewhat elevated, that the Fed uh, won't be so quick to cut rates and perhaps they'll uh, wait a little longer uh, before deciding to do so. So no indication yet from the Fed uh, in terms of, saying that explicitly they're going to start cutting rates. And in fact, I think Powell kind of is erroring on the hawkish side of things and saying we have to make sure that this inflation problem is kicked before we start talking about uh, cutting interest rates. So keep an eye on that. Is this the end? The question still remains. Market saying, yes, for sure, this is the end in terms of rate hikes. As we know, the market's uh, been wrong many times in the past. So if all of a sudden we have some kind of a uh, uh, resurgence in, in inflation, these expectations are going to change. Of course, if all of a sudden we have a lot more negative data in terms of a recession oncoming, perhaps the rate cuts can be quicker uh, and sooner even than the market is anticipating. So we'll watch those pretty closely to see which way it develops. But in terms of that inflation front, Fed has now a lot of ammunition to say we're not going to do anything when they meet in June already. So they have that CPI now down below 5%, uh, 10 consecutive uh, monthly uh, declines in that year-over-year -year rate of inflation. Remember last June, we peaked at 9.1%. That was the highest inflation we've seen since the early 1980s. And what's been driving this move lower in terms of overall CPI? Well, most of the components are seeing a shift uh, lower. So in terms of the energy space, you're seeing a huge difference from uh, the peak last June. You have fuel oil, gasoline, gas utilities, now all down in terms of the year-over-year -year basis, that we're seeing where they were last year. What an incredible difference. Fuel oil was almost a double, gasoline up 60%, gas utilities up 38%. So big shift in the energy, energy space. We're also seeing used cars still negative year over year. New cars finally starting to show a decrease in terms of the rate of inflation. Medical care almost flat year over year. Apparel coming down. What are the areas where we're not seeing yet a decline versus last, last June? Well, three areas. One, transportation. I suspect this will start to come down in the, in the next few months. Food away from home has been stickier than food at home. And I think a big reason for that is the wage price inflation. Uh, restaurants have higher costs there. And so they haven't been as quick to cut costs, even though food price inflation is coming down. And we'll talk about that later and coming down pretty rapidly now. And I would expect that to continue or down to thankfully 7%. A year ago, that was running over 12%, still very high, uh, but hopefully we're going to see that continue. But the big one here in terms of why uh, the uh, rate of core inflation hasn't really moved that much lower, still at 5.5%, is the shelter component. Now, shelter is huge in terms of both the overall CPI, but also that core CPI, even a bigger weighting there. And shelter, 8.1% still remains elevated. Remember last month, 8.2% was the highest we've seen there since 1982. But finally, there's some light at the end of the tunnel we've been talking about over the past year, how shelter CPI has been a lagging indicator, significantly lagging the rate of housing inflation on the way up. So we had this huge 
uh, boom in terms of rents and home prices in 2020 and 2021 and the first part of 2022. And shelter CPI barely budged in terms of increasing. Then we have these factors start to peak in terms of rents and home prices on a year-over-year basis start to move down very rapidly starting last year. And shelter CPI was still moving up. And that's because it's a lagging indicator. It's not looking at real-time data. But finally here, we're seeing a tick lower. 8.2% last month, 8.1% this month. So perhaps we're at the very early stages of seeing shelter CPI start to move down on a year-over-year basis. Now, it's still going up on a monthly basis. So shelter CPI was still higher for the month of April but on a year over year basis starting to go down. And if we look at this comparison here, since the start of 2020, shelter CPI versus uh, apartment rents, and we can see here, there's still a gap. So it's possible that we'll, we'll continue to see increases at least in the monthly shelter CPI number. I just think that year over year number is gonna start to come down. And at some point, probably later this year, you're gonna see a significant uh, rate of decline, I think, in shelter CPI, assuming that home prices uh, don't jump back up and assuming rents don't jump back up. And that's going to lead to a more rapid decline in terms of the CPI because shelter is over a third of the index. So big factor there, positive factor, moving in the right direction. Now, in terms of the Fed, uh, I think they have enough room right now to pause, but just before the next meeting, just be- a day before the, the Fed meets in June, uh, there's going to be another CPI report. And by my calculations and by the Cleveland Fed's models calculations, you are likely to see a sharp move lower in terms of that year-over-year inflation rate. And the reason is just simply base effects. You're now kicking out uh, last year's number Uh, in terms of the comparison. So if we're looking at May, 2022, we saw a huge spike higher. We saw that as well in June, 2022. And and um, when you calculate the year-over-year inflation rate uh, for May, uh, you're going to kick out this 0.9% increase and likely replace it with something much smaller. We don't know what that number is gonna be in terms of of the month over month for, for May just yet, but it's likely to be much smaller and that will lead to a pretty sharp decline in the year-over-year rate of inflation. The uh, the Cleveland Fed is expecting 4.1%, so that would be down from 4.9%. And I think that's more than enough for the Fed to say, let's just pause here and we don't need an additional hike at this point. And so when we get to the June uh, CPI number, which will be released in July, uh, you're going to see an even bigger year-over-year decline because this was a huge number, this 1.2% increase last year. That's when the price of uh, crude oil, many other commodities were spiking higher. Gas prices moved above $5 a gallon. Uh, and when we eliminate that, that's going to lead to a much lower rate of inflation, probably below 4%. Uh, and so the Fed, again, is likely to pause at the July meeting because meeting, they'll have that additional data point. So what is the market expecting for that June meeting, June 14th? Almost 100% chance the Fed doesn't do anything. They leave rates at 5% to 5 and a quarter percent. Uh, and we'll just monitor this as we get closer. And as we've talked about, the Fed does what the market expects it to do. And it's kind of circular because the market's uh, feeding off the Fed. But as you get closer, the mar- market is expecting no change. I think that's uh, pretty much a done deal that the Fed is going to pause here after that 500 basis points and increases. So what have we been talking about in terms of why the Fed has continued to hike rates, even though people have said uh, the Fed should have stopped, that it's a mistake, they're making a mistake. Well, it's been this chart here that's comparing uh, wage growth to average uh, in terms of average hourly earnings to that inflation rate. And what I've shown month after month is now we have 25 consecutive months here of negative real wage growth. So, so that simply means that if you look at a year-over-year change in people's uh, wages and you compare that to the year-over-year change in, P- in the uh, consumer price index, uh, you have this gap, this negative gap where prices are going up more than wages. And that's a loss of purchasing power. That's a, dis- a decline in prosperity for the American worker. It's not a good thing. And so the Fed had a choice to make. They could just ignore that, 
or they could try to tackle uh, inflation by raising interest rates, normalizing policy, decreasing the money supply, as we've talked about, and trying to bring down that rate of inflation through demand destruction, uh, through decreasing the money supply. And so far, they're starting to achieve that goal. And I think when we get that next CPI print, that this is finally going to move back into positive territory, which is awesome to see. Hopefully that happens and hopefully it stays there because the last two years have been really painful. If we compare U.S. wages to various CPI categories, most of the CPI categories, most of the major categories have increased in terms of prices well above the uh, wage increases. So people are feeling this. If you look at sentiment polls and look at, we talked about consumer sentiment, why it hit a record low last year, why it's remained so low this year. And it really comes down to this factor right here that people are seeing their uh, prices at the grocery store, prices at, at the gas pump, all, all these different prices increasing more than their wages. And that of course has people very nervous. Uh, you don't have, uh, you don't have a lot of confidence in terms of spending. Uh, if you're seeing these price increases outpace your wages. So I think if we can get that number back above zero, which we sh should see with the next report, uh, you're going to start to see confidence uh, increase, assuming we don't have that recessionary part and, and major job losses. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but in terms of uh, small business optimism, similar to a consumer sentiment here, we're at a, uh, over a decade low. And if you look at the reasons why the number one reason that small businesses are talking about is still inflation. So if uh, we can get this inflation picture under control, maybe we see this start to move in the other direction. Of course, we have to confront with that possibility of a recession. And if we have a recession, obviously not likely to become much more optimistic during that period of time, but we're getting to levels uh, we're getting closer to levels where we're seeing sentiment, where it's so negative that it can only get better. Maybe we're not there just yet, but getting closer. So we got the latest employment report and what it showed is really a continuation of a trend that we've been seeing, which is people are coming back to work. And if we look at the unemployment rate, 3.4%, that's the lowest we've seen tied for the lowest we've seen since 1969. So uh, tick back down to 3.4%. Certainly, uh, if people are talking about still in terms of the Fed funds rate, um, some people are saying the Fed should be easing here. Uh, there's really uh, no way to argue that if you're looking at the employment data and comparing it to, to a CPI, inflation still remains the bigger risk if you're going to try to balance the two. So interesting, a lot of people talk about the labor force participation rate, but they really don't take the time to really break out the different factors that are driving it. And if we look at the prime age of workers, so 25 to 54 year olds, so this is uh, after you graduate college, this is before retirement age. What we're seeing here is a resurgence in terms of the participation rate that we haven't seen since March, 2008. So we're above pre-COVID levels. Of course, we had this huge drop lower, slowly climbing back, and now we're uh, at the highest level since March 2008. And if we go up a little bit more, it's going to be the highest level since even well before that. So uh, a huge recovery in terms of the participation rate. We've talked about a lot of the reasons why people are coming back to work. Go back to that chart of comparing wages to inflation. If that persists for 25 months, uh, people simply have to work uh, to be able to afford basic necessities. So more people coming back to work, the stimulus programs wearing off, also a factor. And if we look at why that overall part participation rate has not recovered to pre-COVID levels, it's really a story of older workers who dropped out of the labor, uh, labor force uh, during that COVID period, many of them retiring, and they simply haven't come back the same way the 25 to 50, 54 year olds have come back. So it's really an age-based thing. Uh, if people were close to retirement, that probably tipped them over the edge. You had, of course, a huge market boom. You had the, the stimulus. Uh, so people have that cushion uh, and older people tend to have more assets. Uh, and we've just seen a massive asset appreciation over the past few years. That might be driving as well. So all of these factors uh, suggest 
that there's a much stronger recovery, recovery in terms of the participation rate than this overall rate would indicate. So as baby boomers age, of course, too, which is happening every single day, you're, you're going to see more of them retire, more people 55 plus uh, uh, leave the, the labor force. So that's going to be uh, affecting this trend. So really the one to watch is this 25 to 54 level. And if it continues to increase, I think it, it's going to show continued loosening of the labor market because people are simply coming back to work. So this is a trend hopefully will continue. We now have 28 consecutive months of jobs growth. So simply looking at that non-farm non payroll number, is it positive? 28 months in a row, I'll take it. Uh, and if we look at, uh, if, if we try to guess whether it will continue, at least for another month, I would suggest the odds seem pretty high. And the reason for that is we still have this gap. It's getting smaller, but we still have this gap between job openings and unemployed. So we still have uh, job openings exceeding the number of unemployed by 3.8 million. So uh, more than enough jobs for the people that are out there who are unemployed, who want to uh, come back to work. Uh, they just have to find that right job and uh, slowly but surely it's coming down. And we're also seeing that job opening number come down as well. So I think that these two factors are going to lead to that very, very tight labor market that we had a year ago is finally starting to loosen up. And so uh, in terms of uh, predicting non-farm payrolls six months or a year out, very hard to do. But I think we should see all indications seem to point to at least another month of gains uh, when we get the next employment report. So in terms of earnings, this is a, this is a fascinating one. Uh, there's a lot of negativity going into earnings and uh, rightfully so because the indications were it, it, they were going to have another quarter of weak earnings. Uh, a lot of the company's guidance from the prior quarter was pretty negative. Uh, but in terms of uh, what the results have been thus far, we've seen really an upside surprise unexpected here. 86% of companies have now reported, so not everyone yet, but the bulk of the, the big uh, companies have al already reported. And we have year-over-year -year sales growth of 7.5%, so still pretty strong, still above that rate of inflation, incredibly. So people still spending, at least in terms of, of uh, corporate sales, uh, up above the historical median going back uh, in time to 2001 here. And if we look at earnings, if this uh, data holds here, we're going to have actually a positive year over year number of term in terms of S and P 500 earnings. So uh, pretty remarkable up 6%. Only a few weeks ago, it seemed like we were going to have another, another negative number. Uh, we've had a few in a row here. Uh, so this is a, really a flip and, and the markets kind of responded pretty well overall to this. You're seeing NASDAQ 100 uh, up over 20%, S&P 500 holding its gains. So the big companies uh, seem to be responding well to earnings thus far. And if we look at uh, one of the main reasons why, it's really been a profit margin story. And again, here unexpected, uh, all of those cost increases over the past year uh, were last year they were putting pressure on companies. Companies were having a hard time, increasingly a hard time of passing on those costs. Uh, that wasn't as big of, of a factor, it seems, in the first quarter. If you listen to a number of the conference calls, it seems like companies were able to pass on their, those costs and then some, especially in that consumer staple space. If you listen to Pepsi, Coke, uh, McDonald's, even uh, talking about uh, they have pr more pricing power uh, so pro operating profit margins af actually ticked up to 12% during that first quarter. Interesting to see that given there was this expectation that profit margins were going to continue to come down. So uh, interesting uh, that we have this flip market again, seems to be responding well to it. If we look at the actual revenue growth of the big uh, tech companies, uh, wasn't that in impressive, really a slowdown for most of the companies in terms of uh, growth rate today versus uh, the last decade. Uh, but really, I guess the expectations were just so low that anything better than those expectations would lead to an upside surprise. So Apple, I think being the best example of this, down two and a half percent in terms of its year over year revenue growth, net income was actually down 3% year over year, and yet the stock rallied on earnings. Uh, and Apple's not far off from its all-time high, just fascinating. And so we have year-over-year -year revenue growth 
slowing for most of these companies uh, in terms of, of where they were a decade ago. Uh, and if we look at S&P 500 here, we have a number of them even below the market rate of revenue. And yet, as, a, as I said, tech uh, pretty strong this year. And perhaps that's just a mean reversion from last year. And the, obviously these stocks were extremely beaten down in 2022. But I think surprising nonetheless that QQQ, NASDAQ 100, up over 20% this year and really leading the major indices higher. So if we look at um, the price to earnings, price to sales, really interesting because this wasn't supposed to happen. If you listen to the pundits, the pundits a year ago, they were talking about uh, interest rates rising. That would bring down multiples, right? And you know my opinion on this, that it's, uh, it's uh, people put much too much emphasis on, on, uh, on, on interest rates in terms of where the expected multiples people seem to think that there's a simple formula that you can, you can do where if an interest rate is X, then the, uh, multiple that a company get is going, gets is going to, going to be Y. And that simply isn't the case. You could look back historically, we're very high interest rates, well above, uh, where interest rates are today in the 1999 when you had this enormous boom for tech stocks and valuations hit the most extreme levels in history and that didn't wasn't prevented uh, by these higher interest rates that you saw and so what we're seeing today interestingly is still elevated price to earnings ratio so a year ago or 14 months ago we had a fed funds rate at zero we had the 10-year entering 2022 at below two percent and so uh interest rates much higher today both on the short end on the long end uh, but if we look at the s p 500 uh it's multiple uh not too much different than where it was a year ago so this notion that stocks were supposed to reflect that higher rate of interest uh, and trade at a lower multiple that qu hasn't quite happened it happened for a little bit last year you had, of course, that big decline that where the market bottomed in October, but this rally back has really pushed up the multiples uh, pretty much back to where they were a year ago. So we have a price to sales ratio of many of these tech companies still elevated versus their historical levels, especially companies like NVIDIA. We've talked about the AI uh, component there and the ex high expectations there, but even looking at Microsoft and Apple, those are the two biggest companies in the market still trading pretty rich, almost, almost uh, 30 times earnings for Apple, over 30 times for Microsoft, and on a price to sales basis, well above uh, the market multiple, given that Apple just had a quarter of negative revenue growth, negative net income growth. Interesting to see still a very high multiple. So on the next video, I'm going to really dig into overall valuations for the market, how it compares to last year, where, where we compare to the 2000 uh, peak in terms of, of earnings and kind of put everything in context and see where we are and what the expectations are, right? So the market is always forward looking. And so is there a reason, is, is perhaps the reason why these multiples are still high is that markets are saying that earnings are gonna re fully recover uh, by next year and be much higher and therefore uh, these multiples will come down that way. Perhaps that's what uh, the market is saying. So we'll look into that as well. So talking about markets, I think the bond market has been the most fascinating market, especially on the short end of, of late. And on the last video, I was talking about the extreme short end, looking at one month treasury bills. And just, we saw this crazy thing where month, one month treasury bills uh, collapsed. And that's this over here. And we, we talked about that was not likely to persist because the Fed was about to hike rates above 5%. Well, not only did it not persist, but it went extreme in the opposite direction, hit its highest level on record 5.76. It doesn't go back very far, the one month data, but uh, nonetheless, we saw a flip here from the most extreme spread uh, with the three month in history, with the three month much higher than the one month to the opposite where the one month is above the three month by 50 basis points. And that was uh, almost the most extreme in history. Only November, 2007 was higher. So crazy situation where in just a few weeks you moved from one extreme to another. And what's the reason for all this uh, craziness in the bond market? Well, everyone seems to be blaming it on the debt ceiling. Uh, and saying that uh, various uh, various opinions here, but saying essentially 
that people uh, sometimes they're more afraid of holding the one month or they're more afraid of holding a three month. And that has led to this uh, crazy distortions in terms of uh, investor expectations and, and piling into to, uh, one of those two maturities and driving that uh, relationship really haywire. And really it's been on the one month end uh, that has seen the most extreme impact of that. And so I'm going to save the debt limit uh, uh, conversation uh, for the next signal, signal and noise that I'm doing with Peter Malouk. But uh, my sh- uh, short uh, stance remains the same. The debt limit is a farce. You cannot have a, a, you cannot have a limit on debt when you borrow more money than you take in, as the U.S. government does. So the debt limit will be raised as it always has, and I suspect this craziness in the bond market, uh, when that happens, will very quickly normalize. So let's talk about this saying and be very careful uh, with with these blanket statements that people like to make that assume that the market's going to. Uh, behave uh, uh, according to this uh, this saying. So adages are are frequently repeated uh, in markets, but you have to be very careful uh, when people say that something as simple as rising rates are good for banks. And that's what they were saying all last year. Rising rates are good for banks. Banks are going to make more. Their net interest margin is going to go up. They're going to be making more. Uh, and the the, the, the price that they're paying on their deposits going to stay low and banks are going to benefit from that. All, all, we heard that over and over again. Now we've had rising rates here for 14 months, effective Fed funds rate above 5% now came from zero. And what has happened to bank stocks? Well, they've come down significantly. They've been cut in half from where they were uh, 14 months ago. So rising rates, not so good for banks when those banks are holding assets that go down when rates rise. So we saw that with Silicon Valley Bank uh, when they have a balance sheet consisting of long duration treasuries and mortgages and interest rates rise, the value of those uh, assets goes down. And when deposits start to flee, well, then they may be forced to sell some of those assets, which which they did take a loss. And then there's a crisis of confidence. Deposits uh, continue to flow out uh, and, and so on. So Rising rates sometimes can be good for banks, but certainly not always. And we're in a situation today where rising rates have caused a lot of problems for banks that have these assets and then have this uh, fear, this run on the bank, uh, where very quickly they, the, the worry is they might have to sell those assets and take a big loss. And really, this is an issue that's not going away. And PacWest seems to be the next one that people are talking about. They reported a, a loss in their in their recent earnings report, they reported an outflow of $5 billion in terms of deposits. But incredible uh, to me was to see that they still have $8 billion out of those $28 billion of their deposits are uninsured deposits. So there's still people out there and sizable in some of these banks. Most of these banks, it doesn't rise to that level. It's not as big of a percentage of their deposits. Uh, but uh, PacWest is one of these banks where they still have a pretty high percentage in these uninsured deposits. And the question is, what are they doing? Why are they still there? And uh, we'll only know after the fact if, if those deposits are going out the door. Uh, the market seems to be swinging wildly back and forth from day to day saying this is going to be an in- imminent failure or not. If it's not PacWest, though, it's likely to be someone else. We, we probably, you may not have even heard of it yet, but it's, it, it seems very unlikely uh, that the uh, failures would be limited to just the three banks that we've seen thus far until there's some change made in terms of the FDIC policy. Uh, there, there seems to be very little incentive uh, for people that have uninsured deposits to keep them at a bank that where they're not sure if they will receive a bailout that's similar to Silicon Valley Bank. So if you have your money above 250000 you're at PacWest, uh, you're either A, betting that you're going to receive that bailout, or B, you don't really know what you're doing. You don't not practicing risk management, right? So you could very easily move that money into a place where buying treasury bills or into a too big to fail bank uh, where you could have a higher degree of confidence uh, that your money's not at risk. And, and perhaps that's already happening. And until the FDIC does one of a few things, either raises the limit uh, or to extend the limit, let's say for a year to everyone, uh, or they do different tiers for different 
uh, accounts, the business accounts have bigger things till they say one of those things and, and perhaps a combination of those things, uh, you're likely to continue to see this. My personal preference, as I've said before, would be none of those things. We have a limit, keep the limit, uh, or Congress can choose to raise it if they like, but why should everyone have to pay uh, for this deposit insurance when 99% of accounts don't go above the 250 limit. Most people only have a few thousand in their bank accounts that are far below the 250,000 limit. So why should they be uh, paying the cost for these uh, big companies uh, to insure their deposits? There should be a simple form when you open a bank account where you check a box, two boxes. One box says, um, I'm above 250, but don't want insurance. The other box says, I'm above 250 and I want insurance. And this is the rate that you're going to have to pay to have that insurance. So make it pretty simple for people. And then the onus is on them. If the bank ends up failing, well, the full disclosure, you knew about the limit, you didn't want the insurance or you have the insurance you pay for. It. And that way there's skin in the game for depositors and everyone doesn't have to bear the cost of insurance when very few people need it. So hopeful i haven't heard anyone propose that I'm hopeful that it will be something like that uh the alternative would be simply you charge the banks you make deposit the fdic limit much higher you charge all the banks much higher in terms of their cost and they're going to pass that on to the consumer so we'll all have to pay for it. i don't think that's uh the best solution uh but that seems to be what more and more people are talking about so let's talk about the winners and losers of this situation and we knew uh, this, I talked about it uh, the last month in terms of when there's blood on the street, that's when you want to buy. And these people, these banks that are coming in and buying these asset, assets of these failed banks at a huge discount, very favorable terms. They're often sharing losses with the FDIC. So their downside is capped and they have this huge upside because they're buying these assets, which are not extremely risky assets at a huge discount in terms of what they were marked at uh and it, what we're seeing here for first citizens bank is is the best example so far they bought a lot of the u.s assets of svb financial took over the deposits uh and took over the branches and what we've seen here is just a huge spike higher in terms of the share price of first citizens uh investors essentially saying they got a great deal and they really did if we look at the market cap it's now more than doubled off of the lows here, $17 billion company. Uh, interestingly, Silicon Valley Bank just a few months ago was a bigger bank than First Citizens. Of course, it, it, uh, it uh, files for bankruptcy, fails, file, files for bankruptcy. Equity is now only worth $30 million. Uh, but we have First Citizens just a glimpse here in their first quarter report saying that their net income is $9.5 billion. <laughs> for the first quarter. And that's because of the assets they bought on the cheap. So they're saying their gain from acquisition is 9.8 billion. So just for comparison, in the three months before they made 257 million. So that jumped to 9.5 billion, 9.8 billion related to the acquisition. That's a huge number for the company of the size of first citizens. So you're talking about just a huge windfall for shareholders there and the markets responding to that. They initially gapped higher after this sale was announced, but it seems like the expectations were too low. And this is an important point, I think, for investors. It's hard to price in something of this magnitude. It's hard for markets uh, to get this right. And they underestimated how good of a deal this was for first citizens. So interesting. I think there's going to be more winner, winners or losers as this continues. JP Morgan, obviously, we'll find out in the next quarter how good of a deal they got, but really fascinating to see both worlds. You have shareholders and Silicon Valley Bank being wiped out and this other bank being rewarded for buying these assets on, a, uh, on the cheap. So let's talk about uh, Ferrari and just incredible story. I talked about it in a prior video saying really fascinating to see the shares of, of, of Ferrari hitting an all time high, not something you typically see during a recession. They reported earnings and really solidified uh, that share price increase. It's up 37% this year, all time high, huge gains in terms of revenues, earnings, et cetera. I thought this was really interesting. They're now 
booked into 2025. You want to buy a new Ferrari, not going to get one until 2025. And they have this one model, this Daytona SP3 model. Ferrari only made nine, 599 of these units. Starting price was 2.25 million, so not, not cheap. And it sells out before they even unveil it. So you don't even know uh, what it looks like. You can't test drive it. Any of that sells out immediately. So just still huge demand in the luxury market. And, uh, and uh, if you're asking the reason why, well, there was a huge amount of wealth that was created in 2019, 2020, 2021, as we've talked about, if you look at US, just the US household net worth, and obviously Ferrari is a global brand. So you have other countries uh, buying into that as well, of course, uh, but huge in increases in wealth in those uh, few years. Uh, and the obviously the wealthiest people are getting the lion's share of this because they have most of the assets. And yes, we did see a decline in 2022, but very small in comparison to what we saw uh, preceding that. And perhaps it's as simple as that. Uh, if you had assets uh, uh, heading into 2020, you're still uh, in a much better position today. And inflation, as we talked about, much worse on people with lower income, people who don't, don't have assets. If you have assets, it doesn't mean inflation is going to be great for you, but much better, uh, much, much better off than if you don't. And if you own property, your own other assets, financial assets, you've seen just a huge increase in wealth and people seem to be spending that. And there's just a limited supply of Ferraris. They really have obviously calculated this uh, pretty smartly, uh, keeping the number of units low enough where there's just huge demand and that demand out, outpaces the supply. And of course, that's going to drive up the price. Uh, let's talk about, we're going to end with two positive things. One, let's talk about eggs. And we talked about this a few months ago. Egg prices were spiking. I said, don't worry, egg prices will come down. Don't go out and buy chickens like people were talking about. That wasn't going to be worth your time. Uh, and at the end of the day, egg prices are going to come down and come down likely very quickly. And that's what they're doing here after peaking in January, 482 for a a dozen grade eight large eggs. They're now down about a third to 327. So still high, but this is going to continue to come down. And how do we know that? If you look at wholesale egg prices, that which leads retail prices, we're just seeing absolute collapse. So down now over 80%. And so this is the beauty of if you let free markets uh, do their job, supply and demand's going to balance. And we've seen obviously a increase in supply alleviation of the issues that we were talking about a few months ago and that is going to lead to lower prices and so this is a very good thing and overall food fight price inflation as we've talked about looking at agricultural commodities looking at the price of fertilizer these are leading indicators for food price inflation and i'm thinking that you're going to see a much better number in the next two two months seven percent still very high better than it was but still very high and i'm hopeful that we're going to see that number come down so very good news on the food front and it's really an argument to let the free markets do their job a few months ago people were saying they, they should uh, cap prices in terms of eggs they should do all of these other things uh, that would have led uh, of course, to price it, you know, having price controls would have led to just an increase in demand. Of course, because you're not letting uh, you're not letting the cure for high prices uh, do its job. So, if you said eggs can only be sold for two dollars, you're very quickly going to sell sell out. You're going to have long lines. You're not going to allow supply and demand based on the market to even out. So, uh, good to see here. Hopefully, it continues on the food front. Finally, you have this. Holy grail indicator. And it's a beautiful thing. I didn't expect it to work this time uh, around, but at the end of the day, it ended up, the market ended up rallying uh, back. And this sentiment gift is the gift that really has kept on giving. And that's the CNBC markets in turmoil indicator. So this was last May, May 5th, 2022. Uh, Dow is down a thousand points. NASDAQ's down 5%. They do this special report. And this was nothing new. We saw it starting back in the flash crash in 2010. Then we had the 2011 bear market, 2015, 2016, you had an uh, earnings recession, you had China issues. 2018, you had, of course, the Fed hiking interest rates uh, before they started cutting. Uh, so, and then of course, during COVID 2020, they did it pretty much every day. 
as you can see, all of this green here is just looking at the total return on the S&P 500 a year later and then cumulatively. So to today, how is the market done following these specials? And up until May 5th, 2022, you had these enormous gains, small one here, smallest one so far, but still positive nonetheless, up one and a half percent from that May 5th, 2022 markets in turmoil. Pretty incredible to me that we managed to, to uh, put this into positive territory given where we were last October. So it took a huge rally, it took a 20% rally from the S&P to push it into positive territory. But what I like to say about this indicator is all else equal and all else is never equal in markets. So uh, you could throw that out, but assuming all else is equal, you'd much rather see this pop up on your TV than just ordinary programming. Because when you have this pop up on your TV, it means that things are so bad that the media is trying to scare you to get to get people to watch. And that use usually historically is some type of extreme. And what, a, what do markets do? Well, there's mean reversion. They tend to bounce back. And when everyone's negative and negative enough to have this uh, markets in turmoil report where people are tuning in, well, you tend to see a snapback in the other direction. Now, when is this not going to work? Well, it's not going to work when you have a long bear market and CNBC does this markets in turmoil, a, a special report, and then the market keeps going down. And it did that last year. We just had this enormous rally back uh, to turn positive. So not a foolproof indicator, uh, but certainly you could do much worse than having the CNBC markets in turmoil uh, popping up on your screen. So we'll end it right there. Have a great rest of your week, everyone. If you like the content, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.